Wait, random not random. There's some chairs in the the front yeah, over here that you can probably steal. Here. The tables are a mess. Yeah, it's not our fault. We don't <laughs> we don't know what happened. <laughs> Entropy was added to order. <laughs> Maximum entropy in here. Actually, more entropy than the universe. All right. So, uh, oh, yeah. So, since you just uh, came in, go ahead and go to RunPod. It's in the bottom right of the, the screen. And uh, add $5 to the account or something like that. Or you can follow along and see what's going on. Basically, OnePod lets you like get GPUs and run stuff on there if your GPU isn't the best. So if you have a good GPU, then you can always. All right, we'll get started in less than a minute. <laughs> you know, being really on the nose on the four hundred five. Oh, there we go, four hundred five. All right, so yeah, everyone, make sure you got your RunPod account set up. Um, yes. Uh, has anyone not got their RunPod account set up who wants to get it set up? Everyone good? All right, cool. So, yeah, now that you have, you have your RunPod account set up, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start up an instance, uh, a 3090 instance. So, uh, yeah, let's go to templates first. And uh, we're gonna start up a PyTorch instance. This way uh, it has everything basically installed for us already. So we'll go to deploy for uh, PyTorch 2.0.1, because PyTorch 1 is garbage. So uh, yeah, this just has all the pre-installed uh, libraries there for us. Now we scroll down to 3090, and 3090s may not be available. So if they're not, if this is like grayed out, then use an A5000, which is basically the same, uh, except like, I think that's the industry, but it's fine. I'm gonna use a 3090. So choose 3090, and then we're going to customize the deployment and add uh, some more disk space. So I'm adding 300 gigabytes, and this is because the models are really large. So you want to make sure you have a lot of uh, disk space on here so that it, um, you can store the models. So go ahead and increase that to 300, uh, or some amount. 300 is good. I don't even think they increase the cost. Yeah, that's good. I, th I think it like uh, there's a persistence value or a persistence cost but it's like what is it it's very cheap yeah so it's mainly like if you have a lot of storage on your RunPod instance and you want to like keep it so one of the things that RunPod lets you do is you can have a gpu and you can turn it off but have all the data on there be persistent so you can open it up again and like launch the instance again and start working the problem is that is that it costs a lot of yeah. money to just keep your data somewhere and they'd rather just like get rid of all of it when you're done so in, they make you pay a lot more. So generally what I'd recommend is you can get a GPU and then later on you can like, like when you're done using it, you just take it down and put it back up again. Cause it's not usually not that big of a, a deal to like bring everything back up, especially if your stuff is on GitHub, you can just clone it. We're also gonna be pushing it to Hugging Face so you will have a model. Uh, so go ahead and set overrides and uh, I guess it's blocking it. But uh, in the bottom right, there's a continue button uh, and make sure you have a start Jupyter notebook here. They don't have like nano or vim on there, which is kind of weird. So we're using uh, Jupyter and then click continue and then click deploy um, and it will start deploying. So just keep in mind when working with these GPUs, they obviously do not give you like pseudo access or admin rights to these machines. So like if you want to be installing things, like that are root level kernel things, uh, yeah. you won't be able to, but uh, generally they're all installed with like all the CUDA drivers you need and all like that low level kernel stuff that you, you'll need to run GPU intensive processes. So um, if they just do all that for you. And then there's also, which is really nice about RumPod is that a lot of the stuff already comes installed. So we're doing the PyTorch one and that will come with all like the hugging face stuff and all the you know PyTorch stuff that you need for, to actually build the entire thing. So on your end, you only really need to, you know, get the GPU, put the template on there, and it just does it all for you, so um, which is really nice. Go ahead and click uh, connect, uh, start web terminal, and then connect to Jupyter Lab. 
So uh, this way, yeah, so you need to make sure you start the web terminal and then you can do that. And we're going to be doing JupyterLab because we can actually edit things. Um, see there. And then the next most important step is to turn on dark mode. So yeah, <laughs> make sure you do that. <laughs> and yeah, that's the setup for RunPod. Um, any, everyone uh, make it there? Everyone, ha anyone having any issues? Yeah, if someone's any, anyone's not following, yeah. just let us know anytime. Uh, I can come over and uh, you know help you out. You have to pay. Uh, you just put five bucks in, and then you can deploy, and it will charge you as you go. So you just throw five bucks in. So repo initialization. Um, yeah. So in the bottom right, there's a clone link there. Uh, can you all see the clone link? Yeah, I can increase the size. All right, so clone link, go ahead and open up uh, like a terminal and then just clone this. Um, yeah. So we're doing so this clone, clone for one that we've already made. Like one a model that we already have access to. I think it's the is this the uh, no no this, this is this is a clone for the uh, scripts. Oh okay okay so yeah we're we're getting all the scripts down so we can uh, get everything. But later on we'll we'll actually get the model and then you know stuff do stuff on that model as well. Okay. Probably just copy it. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Good idea. I'm just gonna copy this. Uh, I'm gonna copy it and send it in the chat. In case you cannot spell like I can. So uh, yeah, just get clone that. Yes, allow. Oh, <laughs> no, get, get clone. There we go, okay, so I can. That works. Uh, yeah, and then you just CD into there. Uh, and let me decrease this size again. Actually, we need, we need to do some pip install still. So after you cloned it, make sure you upgrade pip and then just do pip install uh, requirements. So Python um, pip install pip issue. Um, and this, you have to make sure you update pip because we're using like some of the latest package, package versions. And then uh, requirements will install the hugging, hugging face stuff. So make sure you, you do those. I will move this down here again. That looks fine. Actually, uh, why don't I just send the slides? Let me send the slides to, uh, let me just send the slides to Discord. There you go. And if you guys have any questions, like, you know, after this as well, yeah. feel free to like, let feel us free know. To, feel free to add me. We'd be happy to help you guys out. Okay, cool. So once this has all been downloaded, uh, running it is easy. You just do Python fine tune.py. So I'm going to start this and uh, just do it for a few epochs or steps, uh, not epochs. Um, and it should work, but while that's going, yeah, so it has to download the model. Um, you can see here, it's downloading it. It's like 13, what, what version am I using? Uh, yeah, Wizard 7. So this is a 7 um, billion parameter model, which is 14 gigabytes. Uh, it's stored as a float 16. And um, yeah, so this, if, if you want to look through the script and you want to edit it, uh, I'm going to go through the parameters now uh, while this is loading. So all you got to do is run python fine tune.py and it'll start running. Um, Y'all probably want to edit this on a different data set because uh, it's just doing it on some random data set that I'm doing uh, fine tuning it on, just as an example. But uh, while it's fine tuning, which it looks like it is, Let's go through some of the parameters which y'all may want to change. So the model I'm using, it's Wizard 7. Uh, 
this, yeah, it's just a 7 billion parameter model. Um, base is actually 13. There was some guy who made it smaller to 7. So um, yeah. if you want to use a different model, I have four instances here. Um, if you want to use Llama, you have to make sure you get access from Facebook. So I would just go with Wizard 7 or Wizard 13. Wizard 13 is larger. So you're going to have to compress uh, the bat size and stuff as well. And really quickly, just to explain what these different models are um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Llama, Llama 2 and Llama 1 basically were trained by Meta and uh, they open sourced it so people could use the weights. You have to apply for like a wait list to actually get access to the actual weights, which is really annoying. So, and it's not even like amazingly good or anything. So we prefer to use, um, you know, wizard, wizard 7B, wizard 13B, which are fine tunes from the, from the llama model that are just like completely open source. You can literally just download them with a script. Very, very easy. Um, and they kind of, the reason why you'd use these over something like GPT 3.5 is that this is free. Um, you can run these locally directly from your machine and you don't need to pay anyone for it. As long as you have a, a good GPU, you can literally just do it all on your own. You can run the inference on there and get the output, which is really cool. So you don't have to like, you know, put it into a black box that is GPT 3.5 and 4. Just, oh, put it somewhere so you can make it a lot easier for yourself. Yeah. So um, there's also some Reddit data sets I have uh, because I was curious. Um, if you want something to be mean to you, <laughs> change this to Reddit or Reddit negative. It'll be really mean to you. Just an example. And then squad is like a question answering one. That one is the most interesting. Um, yeah, there's these parameters here, lower parameters. Uh, hopefully we'll get into that later. Uh, if you know how Laura works, feel free to change these, but these are a pretty good default. Uh, outputs is just the output directory. Add a factor, just the optimizer. You can change this to an 8-bit optimizer. Right now it's 16-bit, so it'll make it smaller, but I found that an 8-bit optimizer is very unstable. It's not very good. Learning rate, you want to keep that low. Uh, and then these two parameters here. If you increase this to a Wizard 13 model, make sure you change these to 6. And I tend to try to keep the, uh, I, think the I think it's here. Yeah, it's at the bottom. I try to keep the per device train batch size times the number of gradient accumulation steps around 16. If I make it too high, it doesn't do too well, um, just in just in this case. Um, so yeah, just keep that around it. So eight times 12 or eight times two, 16. Um, if you decrease it to six, just bump this up to three. Too small of a batch size, too much noise, too large of a batch size, no noise and you have problems. So this is a good, good standard. Uh, save steps and logging steps. So it'll print out a log every 25 steps and it saves a model checkpoint, a new model checkpoint every 100 steps. And um, yeah, it looks like it's fine tuning uh, now. So that's good. And it d didn't break. Hopefully y'all got that working as well. So now for like the actual stuff that y'all may want to change. So if we scroll down here, so this, this is just four bit configurations. Uh, you probably don't need to worry about those, uh, just standard four bit. Um, so we got, let me go down to the squad one. So uh, you have this data set, you have this data set of just text. You need to tokenize this for the model somehow. Uh, this, uh, like this function here does all that. So what we have in this data set is we have a question and an answer. So the assistant says the answer, the human says the question, obviously. So we put it, I'm gonna put it in this format. Uh, so it'll be hash, 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 human, colon, the question, whatever that question may be, and then hash, 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 assistant, and then the output. So this is, what, this is the format I'm putting the data in. Um, I don't think I can go see it, but uh, yeah, specifically I'm putting it in that format. You can see here, I take in a question, um, or I take in a, an example, I pull out the question, I attach that to this string, and I do the same with the answer, and I just take the first answer. Uh, there's actually more answers sometimes, but I just take the first one, and then I combine these together. Now the combination is a bit is a bit uh, weird. So what I do is I tokenize the question, and tokenization is just putting it in a form the model can can read and understand. It can work with, and you have to tokenize it. You tokenize it so each not word but word piece, but you can just think of it as a word is uh, is a as a unique ID. So the word has an ID, and that's all you're doing with the tokenizer. And um, 
I'm encoding the question, I'm encoding the output uh, separately, and then I combine them together with a uh, path token. So uh, I'm basically just combining these two together, and I didn't do that before, specifically so that uh, it reaches its max length. And you may be thinking, why don't I just increase the max length to whatever it was before? Uh, like maybe maybe I increase it to 10,000. Well, the size, the number of, or the amount of memory you need for uh, this model would increase quadratically with that. So I'm just keeping this around 128. It's a good standard. Uh, you may want to change that, but you may want to decrease uh, some of the uh, the back size and stuff. So you just encode the IDs and then uh, the attention masks. Uh, yeah. One important thing about the attention masks is if I say create a new file, uh, I'm going to create a new file just to show. So I basically want the model to kind of stop itself in the middle of its, like after it's done thinking. So like if I have, um, let me get an example. If I have this example here and the model says, I don't, I actually don't know what this is. It's in here. No, it's not. Uh, does anyone know the capital of Australia? Melbourne? I don't know. Canberra. There we go. So the model says this. Um, if you don't add a stop token at the end, so you add stop tokens at the end and it's padding, but um, you want the model to learn one pad token so that it knows to stop itself. So it'll put a pad token here and it knows to stop itself. However, if you don't have the model learn that, then it'll say this and then it'll say, oh, this. This is the, the most famous capital and then just keeps on going forever. So you want it to stop itself. You're like, shut up model. I don't want, I don't want to hear your output anymore. So um, specifically, I add that to the script uh, here, uh, right here, uh, where I add one extra pad, uh, one extra token to the attention mask. So it attends to that pad token. And that's, that's, I feel like that's pretty important to add there. Um, and then Labels uh, negative 100 means that the model is not going to be penalized for uh, outputting something incorrectly. Uh, one, on the other hand, means that it will. So um, in the attention, in, in, the, in the labels. So uh, you may want to play around with that um, if you have played around with uh, LMs before. And I can always help you out with this. Uh, create your own data set if, if needed. Um, yeah, but this would probably be the function that you would be editing if you were to do this, if you were to take this code and work with it. Uh, and then the rest is kind of boilerplate stuff. Um, nothing special here. Okay, let's see. All right, cool. So I am going to stop the model here, um, just so that we have time to, to show how to uh, like merge the weights and stuff. So uh, I'm just going to stop it here. Y'all can keep training it, but uh, once it's done training, you'll probably want to train for some thousand steps. You can see the step number here, and you can see the outputs checkpoint, the output checkpoints uh, in models. Uh, no, not in models, we're uh, in output squad. Uh, so really quick to explain what this is kind of doing. So we're performing the fine tune on, on the model, right? So every so often the model will want to like update and like make new checkpoints. And what that means is like, um, let's say the model just goes and dies on it, it says it fails, right? Uh, we want it to have saved at some point in the like, you know, pretty recent past so that you can actually start from there or you can just take that and you know, you can keep working with it instead of having to have to go all the way back to the beginning. So this entire process is, you know, we're loading in the model and then we're performing our, our training on it so that it can learn our new data and actually do things with that new data that it didn't have initially in the previous, you know, iteration. So that's kind of what's going on here. And just so you know, if this is zero, then it died on you and you don't want to use that checkpoint. Uh, that means it crashed and that's unfortunate. And that's why we saved the checkpoints. So um, this checkpoint here is called checkpoint-100. Uh, it's just the uh, it, it checkpoints every 100 steps. So that's why it's called that. Now, once you have this, you want to go to merge.py. Uh, I think that's yeah displayed here. So merge.py, and you want to change this to checkpoint 100. Um, this is the output directory here, and this is the checkpoint number. And I'm using the wizard7 model. If you use a different model, you're going to want to change that. And then you just run Python merge.py. 
So what this is doing is it's taking the weights that were trained uh, that, oh, I need to save it. I think it's working. Yeah, it's working. So uh, this takes the new weights and it puts them uh, together with the old weights. And the reason you do that is so that you keep the model size consistent with what it was before. Otherwise, you would be using GPU memory that you wouldn't have to use. Also, you're doing more flops uh, or you're, you're using more flops and there's no reason to do that. So it just merges the weights together so that you don't have that issue. And it takes a few minutes to do. Um, it's actually pretty slow for some reason. So we're going to wait for that. Uh, Merge.py just iterates over all the um, LoRa weights and what time is it? Yeah, hopefully we have enough time to go over how LoRa works because I'm a big fan of LoRa. I just Laura, like to quickly, to quickly kind of mention what it does. We'll go into more detail later, yeah. but kind of the idea is that you can represent like a really big model in a very small space and then perform actions with that, you know, in that smaller space and kind of do stuff. So we can merge the LoRa weights. So this is like in a really small area and then uh, or a small space and then kind of you know work with that to um, merge these models together that's kind of the idea but we'll talk about how it actually does that later it's kind of like a big process and yeah a lot of stuff goes on um and that's why you saw all those parameters earlier like oh the, the laura r laura a, you know all these different parameters we'll talk about that uh later yeah once this finishes merging it should be done soon yeah. um we will wait for it. Uh, everyone good so far? Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, yeah, uh, yeah just feel free to let us know. Yeah, tell us. If there's anything in particular where you're like, uh, I don't know what's going on here, yeah, feel free to ask. Or like cut us off. Yeah. We'll, we'll be happy to ask, honestly. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, inference scripts. There's infer.ipymb, there's infer.py, and infer interface. I have a mini interface uh, if y'all want to create an interface. Uh, I, have a, I have a mini Gradio interface that um, may be of use. Uh, it's really easy to set up. Um, I am waiting for this to finish merging. Also, if any of you guys, um, so for your projects, you're kind of planning to use like a machine learning model and you have like a certain subset of data. So like, let's say you, you collect some data or you find like a data, I don't know, or you find data of like MRI, like results, I don't know. Um, and you want to kind of put that into a model, this is like would be the process that you would use to take, you know, a pre created model that you already have. So like we're using wizard, uh, and then you would be able to put all that other data, just smash it in there. And uh, it will learn from that data and be able to, you know, respond to your data, what your data set is um, a lot better. So like, let's say you're making a web app and you wanted to be able to, um, you know, have patients be able to put in some information and you you have the llm be able to respond based on the previous information you already have this would be a really good way to do so so instead of waiting uh so when it's done it'll be uh output squad merged model that's it'll be under the name merged model whatever the old um directory was i have something that i trained before this was a it took me three hours to train this uh on here so it was very very short like a dollar um, so I'm going to use that instead. Uh, it's going to download. Uh, since this model is actually good, it's not trained for 100 steps. Uh, we can get a better inference with it. So I'm going to wait for that. Um, it's also merging. But, oh, cool. Finished oh, wow. merging. <laughs> nice. uh, anyways, a useful tool y'all may want to look at is uh, NVIDIA SMI. So if we look at this, um, it tells you how much uh, your GPU is being used. So uh, if you run out of memory, you may want to launch your job and look here. So right now I'm not running anything on the GPU because all the scripts are done running and it's just loading in the model. But uh, I'm going to show this after this is uh, doing its inference. And um, you'll see that this will go up because it's using the GPU. But if you run into memory issues, you may want to look at this or as it's running and training, you may want to look at this uh, to debug if, if you need to debug. Um, if you're changing the parameters at all, then you may want to use this to, to try to debug that. Um, it's a very useful tool in, in general. So um, you can also get some pretty good information on there. Like yeah. uh, there's the sometimes you'll awesome. you'll have some problems with your with your CUDA version. Um, you know, like the the drivers that are actually installed for your your GPU. So NVIDIA SMI lets you kind of see, oh, this is my version. You know. 
Um, why does it think that it's an older version? It should update to the newer version, which has happened to me multiple times and is very annoying. So being able to have those, you know, diagnostic tools to be able to see, uh, especially NVIDIA SMI is really helpful to kind of debug your stuff. All right, it's almost there. Uh, uh, so it's downloading a, a model from the hub that I, I uploaded. Uh, that's why it's re-downloading everything again, but with your model, it won't. it'll load it in uh, instantly if you change it to that. Uh, so it should be starting the interface and I, I can actually share this interface with everybody here once it's should be loaded. Oh, here we go. It's loading in the model so we can watch uh, NVIDIA SMI and you can see it will go up because it's loading in the model. Down one half. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So, uh, I'll just run it on the local, on local host. Um, there's also a public link. If you have share is equal to true, it'll create a public link, but, um, yeah, it's a pretty simplistic interface. Uh, you have temperature, you have the token limit. So temperature is basically how crazy is the output of the model. So if I ask it this with temperature 0 0.1, it'll give me a word. So it just gives me that. You can do some processing with this output if you want. Uh, if I increase the temperature, I hope it doesn't say anything bad because sometimes it does. But uh, <laughs> if I increase the temperature, it says stuff. So yeah, you usually want to keep this around, like you want to keep this around 0 0.1 if you want it to be very deterministic. Zero, it'll output the same thing every time. And as you increase it, it becomes more random. Like you add more entropy into the model. Uh, token limit. If you want it to do, if you want to do inference and you want it to output more stuff, then you can increase this. Like if it, it'll be cut off at this token limit. So if you want to increase that, go ahead. Uh, real quick, the Gradio interface. So it uses a uh, Gradio, and uh, it's just something that it's just easy to spin up machine learning interfaces, and it just has a slider, another slider for the token limit, and uh, this question input. And I have this class up here, infer, which takes in text. I throw the text through the model tokenizer. So that just tokenizes it to different, uh, to the um, IDs. And then I send that through the model, uh, specifically with this temperature, the limit, uh, and then some other parameters here to kind of make the output a little bit better. And I tell it to stop at this token here. If it sees this token, it'll cut it off immediately. So then it gives me the output. I send back the output and then I just display that. So you can do some processing with that. Play around with the Gradio interface if you want that. Um, yeah. So uh, there, there's the other scripts as well if you want to try those out. Anyways, now, now that we have this model, if you want to move it to your local machine, which is a very important step so that you get it off this machine, uh, you want to go to Hugging Face. So uh, the way I'm going to get this off here is just go to Hugging Face, create an account, and you can upload it there. So first step, log into Hugging Face. Uh, you won't have to pay five bucks at Hugging Face. So don't worry about that. Also, for anyone who doesn't know what Hugging Face is, it's basically like you can store your models there. A lot of people like put models on the Hugging Face and you can just like download from Hugging Face. I've heard it called like a repository for models. It is. Uh, it's like the it's like the GitHub for models. So uh, that's why we're putting it on there. So you can just put it on there and then pull it down from yeah. there. It's free as well. So very nice. Uh, go ahead and create a new model. So you click up here, new model. Um, now I'm just going to call this whatever name, just make sure you do it. I'm going to call this uh, like temp for now, because I'm going to delete this. I already have this model. Um, yeah. So call it something. Uh, use the open rail license unless you want to keep your model closed source. I'm not a big fan of. And then create, create the, the repo. So you'll see up here that it has this, uh, this name, and that's the name of your, uh, your repo. So uh, if you click this little button here, it'll copy your repo name. And it's not the link, it's the, uh, it's the ending. It's your username and then uh, the repo name. So you want to click that. And if you go to, uh, where is it? Upload.py, you can... Uh, so you have this local model path. This is the, the path to your trained model. And then you have your repo name. So this is where I'm going to put the uh, the repo name, gmongaris temp. 
That's the name I created here. Uh, you just copy that, click this little button, put it here. Uh, local model path. Um, we train this for 100 steps and it merges the model, so we're all good. Um, and then the token. So I am not going to show my token, but uh, here's a token. And then you're just going to run this and it'll upload it. And yeah, you can get your token. I'll show you, I'll show you how to get a token. Uh, if you go to your profile, so you go to your profile, you go to settings, uh, then you go to access tokens, and then you go to new token, and you create a token. Specifically, you want to like name this token whatever you want, um, call it temp. And then you want to make sure you have write access. So you have read or write, make sure you have write. Um, if you don't have write, then it's not going to work. And yeah, you'll have a token, and then you can just copy the token and put it here, which I'm not doing. <laughs> um yeah so there you go that's how you upload it so when it's uploaded when it's done uploading you will see it on your you'll see it on your hugging face account so if i just go here we'll go here uh there's a model and it if you go to files and versions it'll upload all the model files here and if you want to do inference on this you can just copy this go back to infer interface and uh, now you can just, it'll download the files wherever you want to go. And that's what I did earlier, where I gave it a model and file path that I had earlier. So instead of a local path, you give it the repo path and it'll uh, do the download for you. So it's, it's very, it's very nice. So you can do this on your local machine, just take the scripts and, and do it on your local machine and it'll uh, download on your local machine. So yeah, that's it. That's it uploading. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, speeds are pretty fast on here, which is nice. Yeah, local inference, you just throw uh, the model path in infer.py or whatever you want to use. Yeah, and I have a model here uh, if you want to try it out. Anyways, uh, cool. If everyone has that working, we will go over Laura. Or if, everyone, if everyone's good with that. How much time do we have? All right, we have time to go over Laura. So I, yeah, so that's, that's the whole demo part. Uh, now I'm doing Laura, uh, which is how does this actually work? So I'm going to increase this, uh, just throw it in the middle. There we go. So if y'all are curious, feel free to stay around. Uh, so first, how does this transformer sequence work? Uh, how does this LLM produce text? So the LLM takes in uh, a sequence, obviously. In this case, I'm making it I like cats. And the first step, which we mentioned earlier, is you have to tokenize it. So each word becomes a vector of shape D. So it's a D-dimensional vector, and the model learns whatever that is. So this word I becomes a vector of shape D, and uh, it's, so it's one word to one vector. And this vector is going to be different from the vector like. So you have a unique vector representing each word. And you can represent this as a matrix. That's L, um, I actually call this N later by D, where D can be some dimensionality, 128, 512, 420, um, whatever you want that to be, uh, probably a power two. So first step, tokenize. Now, what's the root behind this, uh, this, these LLMs? It's uh, self-attention. So uh, first, we, first uh, setup uh, for self-attention, the setup is you have this, this matrix, this N by D matrix, which I'm calling I. Uh, I'm calling the, this matrix I, it's the input, and each, it's just three vectors. I like cats. So n by d, three by d, and you do a matrix multiplication, wq, wk, and wv. These matrix multiplications, it is just a, each, uh, each of these vectors, uh, each of the outputs will be a linear combination of all three of these vectors, normal matrix multiplication. So um, yeah, it's just matrix multiplication. And if you've seen uh, neural networks before, this is a feed forward neural network without the bias. Uh, it's just a linear transformation. That's all, all you're doing. And the model learns these weights. The model learns W sub Q, W sub K, and W sub V, which are three different matrices. So you get these outputs, Q, K, and V. And these are three different matrices, which are arbitrary representations of these vectors here. Now, self-attention. Self-attention is the root behind the algorithms. This is, this is the, the beast, self-attention. So you have uh, your keys, you have your queries, and you do an inner product between those two. 
I multiply along the, uh, I do an inner product along the, the D dimension, and you get this similarity matrix. Uh, the similarity matrix is an n by n matrix, so this will be three by three, and uh, your queries will be kind of the columns. Uh, I think I actually have this reverse. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, one of them will be the columns, one of them will be the rows. I always forget which one goes wherever, but it's arbitrary, so it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so it'll be a three. It'll be an n by n matrix, and uh, in this case, it'll be three by three. So if we look over here. Uh, at this leftmost matrix, this is the similarities that uh, it's it's doing relationships with. So you're doing an inner product between these. If you have a vector and you have another vector and you do an inner product, you are going to get a similarity score between those vectors, uh, essentially. So this upper left part here is a similarity score between i and i. So it's going to be really high. This middle part is going to be between like and like. It's going to be high. Uh, and cats and cats, it's going to be high. Now, what is this actually like? Why is this why is this going to be important? Well, I can uh, if I am the word, let's say, like I can route information to the word I. So maybe I, right here, uh, zero point two five. Uh, that yeah, I is doing like what action is what action am I doing? I am liking, so that's an action. So the word like will send information to the word I. Uh, at a high, at a higher importance level, and um, if we look down here at these scores here, and these scores are just arbitrary, but I, I, I the the values are significant in in uh, how I wrote them. So 0 0.9 here. Uh, notice how the cats only relates to cats. It doesn't care about the word I, and it doesn't care about the word like. So it, cats doesn't need any extra information. Now the word like, that's a pretty important word. What is doing the liking? Well, I am doing the liking, so it's going to be a high score there. And what is being liked? Cats being liked, so it's going to have a high score there. And you can see here uh, this matrix on the right here, uh, heat map. And this represents the uh, a routing of information. So if we just look at this middle row here, the routing of information will send uh, four tenths of the token like to uh, this resulting vector. So it's a linear combination of I like and cats according to uh, this, these three scores here. So you do the softmax along the rows, and that's why this adds up to one. It's meant to add up to one. So 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.3. That means I'm taking 0 0.3 of I, 0 0.4 of like, and 0 0.3 of cats. And then you combine these together, and you get your new vector, which is the new representation of like. And that's what this matrix represents. So this middle vector here, uh, remember that was the like vector, will be a linear combination of I, like, and cats. It'll mostly be like, because it still needs to represent the word like, but it'll also have some information from I and cats. And this spans the entire sequence input. So kind of how you can think about it is like, we're putting this information into, or we're putting the sentence information into the, tran or into the, the, the attention mechanism. And it basically spits out at us, like um, how are each of these words kind of related to each other? Um, obviously it's it's learning a lot more than kind of how we're, how we're you know, saying, you know, yeah. and it kind of learns a lot it's more arbitrary. about text. We, we kind of just like say, oh, it's these numbers, right? But you can kind of think of it, of it you know, at a more abstract level that it's learning not only like, like what word, word means, but what each word means in relation to each other. So kind of like, you know, a, a fundamental type of like language theory you could even imagine. So like what kind of language is it learning? And that's why um, one of the things that transformers is really good are really good at is actually uh, translating languages from one, um, you know, uh, from one language to another language. I was like thinking like, what was the word for that? That's, yeah. what, that's what the original paper did. It was translation from one language to another. Um, also, uh, real quick before we continue, uh, I do want to show you how to delete your Unpod instance. Uh, I forgot that. It's probably important. So um, to delete it real quick, I just want to show you. Uh, you click stop, stop pod, uh, and then you click terminate. Make sure you click terminate or else it'll keep charging you for your uh, your memory. Yes, I remember the thing we mentioned earlier with the persistence. If you don't actually trash it, it's going to be persistent and stay on there for all of time. Yeah. And they will be happy to charge you for all of time. Trust me. They really want money. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, back to attention. So this is the transformer. Uh, it has more than attention. Uh, I'm not going to get into 
uh, it'll take a long time to get into the multi-ad attention, how you mask it, why are there norms, what is sufficient neural encoding. Uh, but if you're curious, um, attention is all you need, according to them. <laughs> and I guess it really is. Now, how do you actually fine tune this? So let's assume we have a pre-trained model, Llama, uh, or Llama 2. Yeah, Llama is a general model trained on the internet, so it's good at everything. Now, what if I want to fine tune this model for a task such as question answering, like we did um, with Squad? Now, the naive approach is to just fine tune all the weights. It's just, uh, and by fine tune, I mean you take this model and you want to put it on like a, a specialized task. So you have this general model and you want to specialize it for something. So in this case, we have this general model on the internet. We want to specialize it for question answering. Now, the naive approach is to take that model and just train it again. You take the model, you have it, you know it knows information, and you just train it. You just train it on this new data set. You just change the data set, same scripts, should be easy. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. One, it requires a ton of memory. Like, just doing that normally requires a ton of memory. It takes seven gigs to um, store it in 4-bit, but to do full fine-tuning it, it will take uh, 7, 14, 21. It takes 21 gigabytes if you're just to store the model parameters in their moments for optimizers. Uh, that's not even having batches in there. Not, that's not even having data, so it's quite a bit. Uh, it directly removes old knowledge uh, that the model had, so like it, you're directly removing that knowledge that the model had instead of um, using that, uh, I, I, I would say. So you're not adding to the knowledge, you're just changing the knowledge. And uh, finally, the, the new weights are permanent changes to the model. Um, uh, Laura is like how you fix this. So Laura is all you need? I think so. Um, instead, what if we use adapters? And th the adapters that we're going to use will make this model a lot smaller. Or it doesn't make the model smaller, but you add a little bit of parameters to the model. And you only change those parameters as opposed to changing the model parameters, which um, there will be an image in a second. Um, and the reason you do this is because it's, well, smaller, and you can actually fit it on your device. Uh, it's, you don't need 100 GPU, 1,000 GPUs like Google or OpenAI, uh, open AI, uh, faster to train and less memory needed uh, because you're using um, less parameters, it's faster. And the lower adapters are swappable, so if I train something on question answering, maybe I train something on a different set of questions, and I can stack those together, add them both together, or I can swap them, uh, and it's really easy. So adding the lower weights. Remember how we had the query keys and values? Uh, and these had a matrix multiplication, WQ, which is a learned matrix. Now we freeze this matrix here, and we add two matrices here. One is uh, large to small, so this will be, say, D to 1. So you have this matrix, it's actually a vector. Uh, we'll call it a matrix. A matrix that transforms this, uh, this vector representation from uh, D-dimensional to one-dimensional. And then you have this other one that does the inverse, where it transforms it from one-dimensional to d-dimensional. And it's a, it's, it's a bottleneck. And if you think about this, this matrix on the left here is d-squared parameters. So if I had 3, then it would be 9. And this over here is d by r. And r is the bottleneck part here. So if r is 1, then this would be 3. A, a would just be a 3 by 1 matrix, so that's 3 parameters. And b is a 3 by 1 matrix, which is three parameters. So if we just have D is equal to three, this would take nine parameters and this would take six. Now uh, you scale that up, it's actually going to be 1024 larger than that. So the scale is massive. Uh, this would be 1024 squared. And if we have R is equal to one, then this is 2048. So it's a massive difference. And you're storing this in memory, but uh, you're storing the original weights in memory. But since you're not training them, you don't store them three times. And if you uh, know optimizers from machine learning, you have to store the weights three times for Atom to, uh, to train the weights. So you, you actually have to store three times D squared. Uh, instead, we have these little parameters here, and we store three times D times R. So it's a lot less parameters, and you're going to train these parameters. Now, if we look at the formula up here, we take the old parameters, we multiply them by the input, and we take the new parameters, and we also multiply them by the input. And then you just add them together. So this dimensionality will be the same. D by R, or uh, D by R is A, 
and then B is R by D. And if you multiply those together, you get a D by D matrix, but you don't store D by D memory. So it's really beneficial. And you add those to every linear layer, everywhere you have WQ, WK, WV, or a linear layer or a feed forward layer, you add them there. So uh, fine tuning with lore is the same procedure as normal fine tuning. You just take the model. So like I said before, you take the model, you just throw a different data set at it and it works. Instead, you're optimizing these little parameters here as opposed to this big, this big dense uh, matrix here. And it's low rank because you have a, a it's, you use low rank matrices. Now, um, after you're done training this, and it, you may you may be, uh, what, or one quick side note is you may be thinking, well, it's a small matrix, it can't it can't store that much information. They find that it actually like performs as well as normal fine tuning, so there's no reason not to use it. Sometimes it performs better, so it's just beneficial everywhere. Uh, the LoRa matrices, so it actually does work really well. And there's also another uh, benefit to this is it doesn't add any overhead during inference. If we look at the queries you can uh, extract the i and you have this matrix here and if i define wn as this matrix here and i just so i have this old matrix i have this new matrix i just add them together i store that on my disk then that's my new weight and it doesn't add any overhead because it's basically the same matrix except there's added information and you don't do this mate you don't do this operation here you can uh since like i represented it in black because you can merge them together uh as opposed to blue, uh, just uh, to differentiate that. So you can merge them together and you don't have any extra overhead. So it's just, why wouldn't you use LoRa? Um, and finally, LoRa conclusion, this, this is the last slide. Um, so if R is small, then uh, the number of parameters is much less. Like we said earlier, D squared versus R, uh, two times R by D. And uh, does this hurt performance? No, it doesn't. And uh, this, is another, uh, this is another way to visualize that. Um, yeah. uh, kind of just to reiterate, um, the way I learned how I kind of like learned Laura's to kind of get into my brain was like, imagine if you have like a 4 million by 4 million matrix, right? That's like a ton of crap you have in there. It's like a, a lot of stuff, but if you could instead represent that as like a 4 million by one and another 4 million by one, and you just multiply those together, that would still be a 4 million by 4 million matrix, but you'd be representing it with way less stuff. Um, and then you can just train those things. You can train whatever's in those two smaller matrix or matrices, and that can allow you to, um, you know, fine tune at a larger scale. So it allows you to, you know, do a lot more work without actually needing to do ever, you know, change everything. It's just those smaller things that you can change in it. And like you said, um, it has the, it, the accuracy doesn't even, sometimes it even gets better. Sometimes the, sometimes it's better when you represent with less weights, which is kind of insane. Cause you would think that, you know, storing, storing with less information should not be as good. Or um, training on less information. Or training on less information would not be as good, but it ends up being sometimes even better, which is kind of insane. Um, I didn't think we would have time to go into the uh, quantization, but uh, real quick, you don't actually store these weights in six uh, in 32-bit precision. You store them in four-bit precision, and there's a way to quantize this where, um, like, you represent the the weights inherently follow a normal distribution, and you can kind of split up the normal distribution into even buckets, and then you can do a transformation so that you discretize the weights into four bits. And that means that uh, for every weight you have, it's not um, a full 8-bit, it's not a full byte that you're using. You're only using half a byte. So you can store it at an even smaller scale. And we're using something called QLora, which uh, does this. It quantizes it to 4 bits instead of uh, 16 bits, which is the normal use. Um, yeah, uh, one, that's just one side note. Um, but yeah, there we go. That's, that's everything. Yeah, you should, so QLora is kind of like the, the natural kind of succession to LoRa. Whereas, so Laura, you're representing stuff in a smaller space, and then QLaura basically just takes all those things and just makes them represent with less memory and less everything. So, like, you know, if you have a 32 point floating number or floating bit number, whatever, I, I can never get the words in the right order for that. But if you have like a, a floating point number, you can represent that instead using, um, you know, like an integer. And there's a lot of different, like a lot of math behind it where you have to, you know, put them into different yeah, buckets on a normal sure. distribution. And the reason why you do that is so you can still kind of 
get the idea of what the, the floating point, point number, number is trying to represent. Um, but you don't want to store as a floating point because that takes a lot more memory. So being able to represent everything as like really small integer numbers uh, and still like, I, I think that loses a little bit of accuracy, but like very little accuracy. Um, is not enough to make a difference. Yeah, it's you not enough to make a difference. You can still train and it does really well and makes it so you can train, you know, a huge model in three hours or maybe a huge model in 30 minutes. You know, it's, it's pretty insane. Yeah, I do want to say that I did train the model in uh, three hours and that cost me like a dollar and that was good enough. So um, if you do want to do training, you can do it during the hackathon uh, if, if you want to try that out. Um, yeah, but there we go. That's the presentation. If you guys have any more questions, uh, let us know in Discord. Let us know right now. We'll be happy to respond to any.